let me ask you a question. If a non-Muslim came up to any one of us Muslims right now and asked us the question, why are you a Muslim? Why are you a Muslim? The common answer would be something like this. And I've asked this question to many of my students. Why are you a Muslim? <coughs> they will say, I don't know, because I was born a Muslim. Well, what does that mean, you were born a Muslim? Uh, common answers are, well, because I'm raised in a Muslim family. Is that really why you're Muslim? Because you were raised in a Muslim family? Well, then, if that's the case, any person can be on the right track then. Because a Christian will say, I was raised a Christian, I was raised an Anglican, I was raised a Catholic. A Jew can say, you know, well, well Jews then will be in the highest degree because in their faith, if, if you don't have the bloodline of a Jew, then really, you know, you're not really superior. So then we can say that the Jews really are superior. If it just comes to the matter of being raised upon a religion that your family is on or being born into the bloodline of a particular religious family, if that's what it takes, then everybody's going to heaven. Nobody's going to hellfire. Everybody's on the right track. It's not your fault. I was raised a Muslim. I was born into a Muslim family. I was raised in a Muslim country. No. Because you know what the problem is there? We find that a person who doesn't know why they're Muslim, they will look for happiness somewhere else because they actually don't know their identity. You know, I've seen in many instances young people, they rebel against their own parents. You know why? They move away from the deen. And I've seen two types of people. This is something, an interesting fact. I don't know if you've observed it before, but back in Australia, we observed this. I've noticed that some young people, when they belong to a Muslim family, a religious family, but don't exactly know why they are Muslim, as soon as their relationship with their family goes wrong, like a dysfunctional family, you'll find that they actually detach themselves from Islam. And they start to resort to going with gangs and groups of people who have a particular identity that is far away from Islam. They wear certain jackets. They put on certain, sometimes tattoos of certain sorts. They resort to things like drugs. They go to places where they can be identified and have a name. Some of them resort to even, and I'm going to say this word, extremist views. Not because they want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with them, but because they want to be known. They want to have an identity, a place in this world. So they rebel against their own family because they never knew why they were actually Muslims. And I put some of this responsibility on the parents themselves. When you teach your children, teach them number one, why they are Muslim. When your child asks you the question, who am I and why am I Muslim? Why do I have to pray? It's not enough just to say them, well, you're, you have to pray because you're a Muslim. And then we punish them for not praying, but we don't reward them for when they do good acts. Brothers and sisters, you know, there is this saying, we complain that our children don't obey us, but they never fail to imitate us. They imitate you. So when you are angry at your son or daughter for not praying, what they learn from you is not prayer. They learn from you anger. They learn from you that religion is by force. When this sister, when the girl grows up to wear her hijab and she doesn't understand why she's wearing her hijab, and they find that the community forces it upon her or because she has to fit to the norms of the society without us explaining to them what the meaning of hijab is, what the meaning of khimar is. We don't explain to them that it has a, a huge history in the civilization of humanity since the beginning of time. Then all they think of is, well, you know, I have to wear it because of cultural reasons. And time and time again, I find young people, especially living in the West, and I don't think here in the Emirates we are safe from that because although Emirates is a beautiful, wonderful Muslim country and we have so many Muslim families and communities, Alhamdulillah, you know, I, I get jealous that my children can't be raised in a society like this. I would have loved that, subhanAllah, I mean, just, just to sort of go off topic a little bit. I visited Dubai last year and my daughter, who was eight years old at the time, I asked her, I went to Umrah that time and I said to her, what would you like as a gift 
What do you want as a present? That she was with her mother here in Dubai visiting. She said, I want a abaya. Can you get me a abaya? Now to you, this is probably very normal. You know, it's abaya is abaya, right? Every woman wears a abaya. Every girl wears a abaya. It's very normal. But for me, this was the best gift. Because you see, back in Australia, in the West, no one wears a abaya. Well, they do wear a abaya, but that's the last thing on their mind. They see their friends wearing shorts. They see their friends, you know, wearing clips in their hair and doing their fashionable hair. When she said to me, I want a abaya, it's because she's affected by the community that's around her. Now that's really good and excellent. But when she went back, she's affected by the other community. So I had to plant a seed inside of her. Why, what, what's hijab? Who wears hijab? What is hijab for? What does it mean? And in my son, what does prayer mean? And so on and so forth. If they don't understand that, then they're going to detach themselves. I've seen it time and time again. As soon as they reach, they become teenagers. They rebel against their family, their own parents. They can't wait to be free, as they say. And so they have two identities. One outside the home and one inside the home. 